Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar presentation, Key Data Management Use Cases for a Fast-Paced DevOps World, brought to you by Trulio. I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Kevin Jackson. Kevin Jackson is Senior Solutions Architect at Trulio. Kevin is responsible for customer and partner engagement in the EMEA region, helping enterprises meet their data protection and DR requirements. He has 20 plus years of experience in the system architecture and engineering with AutoTrader UK and Rackspace. Kevin has authored multiple books around OpenStack clouds and subsequently has been on the cloud native architecture journey through Kubernetes. And with that, I will pass it off to Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, as Lucy says, you know, I'm Kevin Jackson, uh, one of Trulia's, Trulio Senior Solutions uh, Architects. So what that really means is I have, a, I have the fun job uh, of taking people through uh, the wonderful world of, uh, of Trulio. Uh, and today I'm taking you through how the world of backup and recovery was once a core function of backend IT and is now a core feature of a fast-paced DevOps world. Uh, data protection is much more than backup and, and recovery. So let me introduce you to, uh, to Trilio. So um, first of all, um, I should point out that Trilio has a number of um, products in its portfolio, but they're all, they're all designed around the, the, the same six key tenets that you would expect from an enterprise data protection solution designed for the cloud era. Um, and so one of these, one of these features um, you would expect is to be agentless. Now let's think about that for, for a moment. Um, you know, in terms of traditional data protection uh, platforms, you know, there's a there's a, a notion that you would have to, to add in extra tools to support this, this extra thing this this thing called a, you know the, a backup you know it's 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 something sometimes considered somebody else's job to to back up your environment but it, it comes into your world when you're asked to to make changes to your uh, your deployed what uh, you know environment uh, to support that uh, that backup so a trillio again we're designed from the ground up for, for cloud um we're fully agentless um, so this means that you can literally just carry on working the way you want to work in your, your cloud environment, but now have features where you can just say, let's just back up this environment, let's back up this data as part of my, my, uh, my cloud uh, native uh, deployment. Uh, in line with agentless, in terms of like you would want to you know, make sure that we're not, we're not getting in the way, uh, is, is non-disruptive. And what we mean by non-disruptive is the fact that we want to we want to seamlessly do our job without getting in the way of your your work. And so our technology it's um, it allows us to to get access to the data in a in a very non-disruptive way, and it allows us to essentially get in and get out uh, without you uh, noticing. Um, so again, in line with agentless and line, you know uh, along with being non-disruptive, we're very frictionless when it comes to this this idea of backup and recovery and these are key um, aspects when considering a backup platform designed for the, for the cloud multi-cluster multi-tenant and self-service i like to talk about these things uh, together so you know both of these together really drive home the the idea of of cloud native uh, environments and usage of cloud native environment you yourself will have uh, your own tenant or namespace on a particular cloud that's where your world begins and ends you own everything inside of those um, those four walls of your tenant space or your namespace um, uh, area and so a, a data protection platform designed for the cloud allows you to continue to to look after those applications and allows you to manage your own applications within those four walls you you create your applications you now back up and protect your, your applications. And we do this with a, a fully integrated user interface. That's either through the command line or through the, the native interfaces of these particular uh, platforms. I thought we could generate some, uh, some buzz in that were light years ahead when it comes to scaling to infinity and beyond. Uh, you, can't you tell I've got kids, by the way? Um, but that kind of talk apparently uh, opens us up to some kind of lawsuit. So what I'll say instead uh, is that we're built from the ground up for these these cloud environments, literally from from day one. Um, 
you know, and what that means is, you know, administrators don't want to be considering a, a an important part of the infrastructure to be, you know, you know, and scale that independently of the of the core platforms where you know people are performing the backup and recovery. We scale literally in line with how that environment grows. So from an administrator point of view, we scale in line with the with the infrastructure. And then from the users, the people actually consuming the cloud, well, we scale, you know, seamlessly as you grow your business, as you deploy more applications, as you deploy more, more into those particular uh, namespaces and, and tenants. So with Trilio, we scale effort, effortlessly. The last thing, uh, the sixth uh, part of the, the, the secrets to, uh, to Trilio and our, our portfolio is our open universal backup schema. Now, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that people don't give too much consideration about the backup format. Um, I think the, you know, the main focus, certainly historically, is a case of, well, my, my application is backed up and you know, I can recover that application or I can recover that data in some form or another. The actual um, mechanism and the actual format of that data being stored is, is of little consequence. But I hate to break it to you, it actually has a lot of meaning and a lot of impact. Um, we use open source format uh, data, we use QCOW2. Uh, just a little, uh, little background information for you there, but it's important to know because that allows you um, and allows a, you know, a number of benefits um, when it comes to data protection of cloud environments. I mean, in fact, it's well known uh, and well understood that in cloud environments, you know, backing up to open source formats um, allow you uh, a, a, a great level of flexibility and portability. And, you know, I don't think, you know, we, we like to talk about this too much, but the, you know, when it comes to Trilio and if, if something changed uh, within Trilio, the key thing here is you can always get access to your data. You know, there's not many tools out there where you can say that you can always get access to your data. And again, that may, may be of uh, small consequence to, to certain, crowds uh, that may be on this call, but for people who are responsible for governance and long-term uh, retention, uh, the idea that you can unlock your data at any point um, over, you know, over decades using open source tools um, does um, bring a myriad of benefits when you come to choosing a, a data protection tool for a cloud-based era. And you know what? We do this over the complete spectrum from hybrid cloud infrastructure, to a container-based world, you know, based on say Kubernetes, to the public cloud, and all the way through the stack of OpenStack and virtualization on-prem and off-prem. So that's Trilio. So let's just concentrate uh, for a moment on to uh, really today's topic. Today's topic is, is more uh, featured around uh, the world of Kubernetes. And when you get our um, our Trilio Vault for Kubernetes uh, operator installed. Uh, or TBK, as the cool kids uh, call it, um, you end up with a, a basically additional functionality to any Kubernetes cluster. So let's let's repeat that. This is a easy to install operator that works on any Kubernetes cluster. So what this means is you can deploy us on your laptop. You can deploy this on your upstream Kubernetes that you've got running on your laptop. You may have a uh, a renter environment, um, you know, running in uh, on-prem. You may have access to a uh, an Amazon environment off-prem. Wherever it is, you can get our um, uh, truly evolved for Kubernetes operator installed, and basically we give you the ability to extend the capability to protect those workloads. And of course, we're an operator that brings this lovely uh, user interface. This is a multi-cloud. Um, multi-user interface and this allows you from a single pane of glass to manage those different kubernetes based environments when we go to uh, to protect your world again we have very low uh, requirements uh, not only will we easy to install but when it comes to backing up the the objects and the information and the applications deployed in kubernetes um, all we ask is the fact that the storage presented uh, in fact, any storage presented to uh, to Kubernetes is presented through a CSI uh, interface. Again, everybody knows you know these days that's the common interface to to storage in Kubernetes. Gone are the days of the the wild west of how you uh, may have managed storage uh, over the last uh, you know six or seven years. 
Um, and we can back all that up and we can back it up to any um, storage that's presented as uh, an S3 bucket um, or to an NFS export. And there's no limits there. You know, you can actually back up applications to multiple places if that is part of your, your desired uh, backup uh, plan. And we don't care where you run your stuff, actually. Not caring, obviously, is a little bit of a, a strong word. We obviously do care about what you do. Uh, you know, we do love you guys and girls and everybody out there. But what we mean is the, the Kubernetes, the tree of Kubernetes product doesn't really care where it gets deployed. It will work on-prem, it will work off-prem. And, you know, you can, you can back up workloads from, you know, one environment um, and recover to maybe your off-prem environment. You may be looking at um, migrating from one public cloud vendor to another, and you can use Trilio to actually sit at heart of that migration. And then when it comes to uh, package management, um, we, we don't dictate how you um, deploy your applications in order to satisfy a, uh, you know, protection and backup of those deployed applications. Um, we, we are very proud of the fact that we very correctly um, back up uh, Helm-based applications so that when it comes to uh, recovery, we're going to be putting back that Helm-based um, uh, release. Um, that, that in itself, uh, you know, has, uh, has obviously, you know, major benefits. You know, we're not just picking and choosing some objects that just so happen to be, uh, you know, exist within the Kubernetes uh, namespace. What we're doing here is we're, we're able to back up the Helm chart, recover the Helm chart, and allows you to continue Helm lifecycle management of that application across this namespace, across those multiple clusters. Same with operators. Back up the CRs, we'll back up the storage, uh, and able to recover them wherever you need those operators if that's how you are managing some of your applications in your environment. Uh, labels, you know, standard deployment-based um, uh, um, applications, uh, of course, we'll be able to back them up. Again, there's no limits to how you want to uh, use those labels to actually, you know, direct the, the discovery of those objects that we can uh, back up. Or you can just take a step back, back up those namespaces, have some kind of auto protection, an orchestrated way of onboarding people, protect those namespaces, protect multiple um, namespaces, so that when it comes to uh, disaster recovery, you can recover everything. Uh, about that particular deploy, deployment and multiple deployments, wherever you need those that recovery to be. So this is what we provide. We provide this point in time backup management, but we do it in such a way that we are um, that you can drive us using your your familiar tools. So your your kube cuttles of the world, your OCs. Your you may be preferring a, a web interface, or you might actually prefer your uh, your Argo CD uh, user interface and pipeline management. However you want to, to manage the data protection, the protection of, of the workloads that run within Kubernetes, um, we can, we can uh, provide that uh, feature and functionality in a very frictionless and seamless way so that you can do recoveries to the existing cluster or to any cluster where you need access to those applications either for testing, migration, or um, literally, you know, to recover your business from um, from downtime. So, in terms of today's webinar, that's all the background. In terms of today, you know, we're talking about the day zero, one, two uh, challenges, and uh, and certainly what I'm uh, not talking about here are some kind of um, in, you know. Uh, you know, 50 day, uh, you know, 50 press ups a day kind of thing, or some kind of like weird, uh, you know, fad uh, diet. Um, we're talking about obviously the the maturity and the progress of IT through day zero, day one to to day two operational uh, side of uh, things. So let's uh, let's talk around the the personas. Um, that uh, that feature as part of this particular uh, presentation. So I'm going to introduce you to four people. Now I don't know them personally outside the the day jobs. I'm pretty sure they are they're great people, uh, but I know what they do um, and the the challenges that they face uh, every day when they come to work. And I'm pretty sure you know you recognise these particular challenges. So the first person I want to introduce you to is Lisa. So uh, Lisa is a developer. Uh, Lisa is responsible for writing the code, building the apps, uh, testing, and um, and she um, you know uh, relies heavily on the uh, the core infrastructure. Uh, she'll be uh, checking in code to, to Git, 
um, and that code will be pushed into like various um, uh, namespaces as part of the, the journey on to putting this into uh, production. Then we have Brian. Um, Brian loves his hoodies by the looks of things. Uh, and Brian is uh, an SRA but sits on the on the dev side. So we've got dev on the left now. And um, Brian sits with, with Lisa. And, and Brian is responsible for that application being deployed uh, successfully, making sure that it all runs. Um, so Brian utilizes um, Git to ensure that there's consistency of those deployments. Um, so that when it gets uh, promoted all the way through the stack and all the way through to production, um, that there's assurances that what we've got running here is golden and is good to go when it comes to running stuff in the prod-based uh, world. And then on the right-hand side, we have Rob. Rob, if I'm being really honest, looks a little bit too smart for operations, but there we go. Rob, Rob is the ops um, SRE. So he's on the other side of that um, coin when it comes to the, the Git ops. So Rob has the view of the world of the, the platform. He needs to make sure that the clusters and the platform uh, is uh, is available. And of course, has a, has a say and a, a role to play when it comes to ensuring that the, the code that is developed by Lisa and is you know curated and pushed and make sure is running as it should through Brian. Um, Rob makes sure that those production-based environments um, are running as it should and the business of course you know continues to uh, to make uh, money um and then uh, lastly we have jane jane is the is uh, ops it director uh, view of the world so she has a bigger role to play obviously she has responsibility all the way through the through the world um, she ensures business continuity at the, the management level uh, she needs to make sure that the hardware and software obviously are fit for purpose and the fact that you know she has that that core view of the world of, of managing the, the, the IT operational uh, world. And so her, her view of the world is, uh, is making sure that um, if anything goes wrong, things can get uh, recovered, in which case she then certainly breathes down Rob's neck to make sure that uh, things are recovered in an appropriate uh, manner. So, in terms of um, day zero, so um, day zero. So we're talking about the, the beginnings of the world here. We're talking about the fact that in the beginning, there was test and dev based uh, environments. So here, this is the world of Lisa and Brian. So Lisa obviously is developing the code. Lisa is obviously checking things into, into the environment. Brian is of course making sure that environment has all what is needed to run that particular code. And of course, you know, this gets to a stage where this, this code eventually gets pushed into various um, stages as part of pipeline. So as we lead into the production-based world, we get to a place where we're, we've got the code now running in a pre-prod type of environment. So Lisa's checked in the code, it's all passed, all those CI CD checks, all the gating has all gone to green. And now the code automatically gets pushed into, into another environment, which runs through some, some secondary um, kind of testing. And again, you know, this is a world of Brian making sure that things are running as expected. And Rob has a say just what's coming down the, the pike in terms of the, the next steps, what's getting deployed into production when somebody checks that, um, you know, that flag to say, yes, it's green to go. And so, of course, we end up in this world of production. So, look, we've got the happy path here that the code was all put into, into tests and it's all gone through fine. It's gone, then gone through all the pipeline and all the integration. And now we end up in a pre-prod, in a staging-based world. And then from there, obviously, all the things checked has, has gone green and we're now into production. So, this is great. Um, and the nice thing here is the fact that, you know, this organization, um, it, you know, uh, deploys code to a Friday. So, they've gone to the pub. So everything is all good because everything was fully tested. Well, not, not really. So there's, there's a problem. But this problem doesn't make sense because we literally, you know, I just literally spent the last couple of minutes just saying how great Lisa was and how tight she works with the likes of Brian. Brian just says, yeah, that environment works fantastically. And uh, Rob is really happy that this code has been pushed for, to production. So what the hell has gone uh, wrong? Well, if we look at this, you know, and again, you know, there's intelligent people on the call. If we look at this, 
obviously, you know, if it's not the code, uh, that's the problem. And I'm, I hear you, it's not DNS either, you know, and it's not the network. In this case, it was actually the, the data that um, is, the, uh, is, is the issue. So, you know, one of, you know, Lisa's challenges um, is having accurate data to, to test with. You know, so in other words, you know, it's all well and good having, you know, foo at bar.com as part of the, you know, the email addresses. But did they expect to find that plus symbol in there, you know, and, you know, and that plus symbol then decided to, to, to cause havoc, you know, when some, you know, database query was ran or, you know, heaven forbid, you know, somebody put a, you know, equals quote, semicolon, drop table, whatever, you know, because somebody hasn't done, the, you know, their, their checking. And I, I appreciate you pick that up. I hope you will have picked that up in a much, much earlier part of your uh, your pipeline. Um, but um, but this is this is this is reality. So we've got a we've got a world now where production is down, and it's determined that it's actually the the data that's that caused things to uh, to blow up. So let's have a uh, look at a, a different view of the world in the fact that we you know if we if you take the approach of a data driven um, uh, approach to um, uh, to your testing. You can you can get to a world where basically you're testing with with real data. So let's let's bring Trillia Vault into into the mix. Remember Trillia Vault in the Kubernetes world, simple installation, something you can control and use using your existing tooling, uh, very easy to pick up, and you can orchestrate this and put this as part of your your pipelines. Um, in fact, we have an example GitHub Runner um, that you know will take you through um, very much this scenario. So. If, I'd rather you, you pay attention during this call, but if you're if you're watching on YouTube, that's fine. You know, go ahead and do some background looking. But we do have uh, another uh, set of documentation which will take you through our own GitHub runner of where Trillia Vault fits as part of this particular uh, pipeline. Um, so uh, by having Trillia Vault for Kubernetes installed and you know some kind of like uh, GitHub uh, runner, um, when Lisa checks in her code, she can get access to to dev data. So essentially, you know. Again, we're we're a little bit down the line here, but work with me. So basically, we can take this prod data from from production using Trillio. This is the manual approach, but you know, then we can you know obviously uh, have this available into this testing environment. So at least testing, at least the staging environment has access to this data. Oh, by the way, did you see the subtle scrub? I hope you guys are and girls are you know scrubbing your data before putting them into into a test environment. Uh, you know, I don't think you want your uh, your two million subscribers. Uh, to to see your test newsletter um, a email, you know, when you should be, you know, changing all them to some some kind of like devnal uh, email um, target. Either way, I, I digress. So in this world, we've got access to uh, prod data now. So staging is has the high level of confidence when it's moved to production. But of course, we can we can bring that back uh, a lot further. You know, there's there's no reason why you can't have a a controlled world where dev have access to production data in a very controlled way. And you can do this in a highly orchestrated fashion. And that's the key thing. Remember I said, you know, there's a lot more to, to backup and recovery when it comes to cloud. These are the reasons why Trilio exists. So now that prod uh, is happy, um, when the code gets checked in again, it can go through all those same pipelines. We've got more accurate data that we're testing against. And we have that high degree of confidence now, much, much high degree of confidence that when it gets to production, everything is good. And you're happy now with Friday deployments uh, once uh, more. But we're not stopping there. Um, you know, in terms of the, the, the team that I, I presented to you before, I mean, the, they, they don't just have a small environment. They don't just have an on-prem OpenShift or an, you know, an on-prem Tanzu, whatever environment it is that they're, they're developing against. This team has to manage the, the hybrid cloud story. These, this team has to manage the, the fact that their code not only has to run in those three scenarios on on-prem using the same kit and same infrastructure, they also have to support the ability to have failover to, to clouds. Um, there's, a, there's an ongoing management discussion, of course, you know, of moving to, to AWS and Azure is also in the running. And so in terms of day zero and day zero testing. So we're talking about the realms of Lisa and Brian here. You know, you're able to take the code and the, the data generated from those development environments. In fact, you can take this from any environment and then have these tested running on alternative Kubernetes clusters. It doesn't have to be on-prem. 
um, and it doesn't have to be the same. It doesn't have to be OpenShift to OpenShift. Literally here, you can have your, uh, you know, an OpenShift on-prem and then your EKS cluster um, where the target is going to be. And the nice thing about Trilio, it's designed for these particular scenarios. When we talk of backup and recovery, literally backup and recovery, when we talk of cloud native data protection tools, is literally the tip of the iceberg. It's the stuff which you just think of, okay, yeah, that's the, that's the feature we're looking at. But put them back, far back into the process, and you get into a world where you're able to take workloads off uh, from one environment and seamlessly be able to deploy into an alternative alien world. So the day one. Uh, so we're moving into, into the realms now of the, the GitOps type of um, world. So this is the realm of, you know, somewhere sits between Brian and, and you know, and Rob, that kind of like universe where the platform is, uh, is, is more important and the actual running of the services are uh, becoming, uh, you know, uh, a challenge to, to keep up. So they chose GitOps type of approach to, um, to managing these, these, um, these environments. So in terms of day one, of course, you know, we still have to have developers, um, so they exist, and they will be generating code. I know it sounds like a pain, you know, they do generate all this change, but they do have to be managed uh, appropriately. So in this case, you know, developers, they will push their code to some, um, uh, some code repository. Uh, code repository obviously will kick off some pipeline activities. Um, but this, this is where Trilio comes into its own. So again, with this operator, with this operator now with the ability for you to hook this into, into pipelines. So in this case, what you've got here is the ability to orchestrate and automate the, the protection or the backup, take a copy of this environment and store that safely. In this case, obviously it's a, it's a backup at this point. And this is no different to how Lisa would be consuming in day zero in terms of needing access to data. Obviously, the difference here is there'd be an orchestrated approach. The second stage of that runner would be to take that data so Lisa can consume and test against it in a, just because she checked into, into Git or wherever her favorite repository is. Now, in the day one world, there's a slightly different view of the world. We need to make sure that this application is running as expected. So code gets deployed. So remember, we've taken a backup of that environment. We've now got code deployed. Um, so if anything goes wrong, of course, we can revert. And of course, there's various ways to do that. Um, in this case, though, the environment is such that the environment has, has gone bad. It's app and data. Something, something's not quite right with this particular deployment. So no matter what testing has gone in before, maybe you need to review those, uh, those unit tests. Maybe you need to review those functional tests, whatever it is. Something has gone wrong. We need to always cater uh, for this. But it's okay, prior to this um, change, we took an, an orchestrated backup. Nobody was involved, that data and that application can be reverted very easily to a good known state. And so that what, that's what happens, you know, between the, uh, the operations of Brian and Rob, it was determined that that was the best course of action before reverting and basically forward fixing with the code with a, with a new patch. But it doesn't really stop there for, for the day one team. You know, as organizations grow, as organizations get that little bit more complex, uh, more tools get brought into, into the fold. And those tools need, need uh, protecting themselves. So if you're self-hosting various um, tools um, that are important and key to the, um, you know, to how you deploy and operate your environment, then they are critical components that also need backing up. So this is the traditional, we need to make sure that these things are protected. But one of the interesting things about using the, the likes of Trilio as part of this world, you know, if you think about what Trilio Vault is doing here, so yes, we can protect your, your workloads, but it protects your workloads because we're discovering the, the important information that exists around your, your application. We're capturing all that metadata and the state of your application at that point. So whilst you know the, the GitOps team of Rob and Brian are managing infrastructure because they're checking in some, some infrastructure change to some YAML, um, you know, there is a there is a you know uh, you know a slight doubt as to well, you know, are everybody following that process? Or you know, are we sure that when we deployed this change to this infrastructure on the, I don't know, the, the 1st of October. 2021, 20, it's now 17th of November. 
are we sure that you know that is all consistent and you know what we're observing some strange behavior in the environment and so with Trilio if you think about what we're doing we're, we're discovering that state we're backing up that state you can compare that state you can actually see the difference between the deployed expected state of your application versus the the point in time capture of that um, of that deployed application and we have a diff at that point and so this is important so you know you're using GitOps to improve your world and you're using GitOps to make sure that things run smoothly but when things go wrong and you need to audit and you need to go back in time to work out when things were changed and maybe maybe this was a maybe this was just one of those two o'clock in the morning you know temporary fixes that just never got put back as a patch to some YAML um, or it could be a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more suspicious. In either case, we've got your back. You can go back in time, you can get that point in time capture and you can always revert and you can always discover what that change was and what that uh, change should have been. So, on to uh, day two. So, day two. So, let's be really honest. Day two is traditionally where backup has lived for, for decades. It's always the, the kind of afterthought. Um, you know, it's always one of those services where, do you know what, we need to have backup, something's gone wrong, and then you realize that we don't need, uh, we don't have a, a great uh, recovery uh, story. Um, it's that insurance, let's, you know, let's, let's, let's call it as it is. Um, so that's where it's traditionally at, and it's the reason why, um, you know, Trillivar goes to great lengths to, to um, fit into the day zero and day one um, uh, view of the world, and we can't just behave as a, as a day two backup and recovery um, tool in the, in the cloud era. Um, but people do obviously have genuine need for, uh, for day two uh, operations. So we take this step further. So whilst backup and recovery, I guess, is the low hanging fruit when it comes to the expectation of a data protection tool, again, Trilio does not stop there. We give you the ability now to take workloads from a deployed cluster and allows you to redeploy, recover, migrate, migrate under duress in, you know, in other words, disaster recovery, those workloads. So with Trillium installed, you can back up your application from one type of application environment, you know, in this case, RKE, for example, and then do a recovery to something else. You may be testing, you know, some lightweight services. Well, hold on, you're thinking, well, that's different. You know, we're just on a you know backup and then a recovery. Well, I'll take it a little bit further. We can do a backup and recovery to to completely different type of infrastructure. So I mentioned this before. So how do we do this? Well, with with Trilio, we we capture all that metadata. So again, going back to that previous slide, we know the the we discover your your um, your application. We know how it's made up. We capture that state. But on recovery, recovery isn't just a simple yes, just go and click this and things will just recover. We give you flexibility in that recovery. Absolutely, you know, if we can put things back the way they were, that's exactly. You can just just leave us and just one click operation bring us, you know, bring that application back to life. But where there's a need to take that workload and change the the destination, change you know, change some of the details around that um, that application to fit the target infrastructure then you can define that very easily in, in well, I'm, you know, in saying some restore YAML or in, in, a, in an easy to, to understand UI workflow. Uh, but typically, and again, you could, you could orchestrate this. Now, all the big bad word of uh, ransomware. So ransomware, you know, again, it's the, it's the bad news part of the, uh, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the presentation. Um, you know, ransomware attacks, I mean, look, everybody knows ransomware attacks are on the rise. So these are these are slightly old stats. I think they're about three or four months old. So I can imagine, you know, a review of this actually increases the, the ransomware attacks. Um, I'm going to also say as well, we talk of ransomware, but we're not going to certainly ignore uh, malware as well. I think, um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the conversations I have, in fact, I think it's 50-50, um, are, you know, uh, equally worried about ransomware in terms of encrypting type of environments. Um, as well as the, the other malicious side of things, which is Bitcoin mining uh, and things of that nature, all in exactly the same bucket. Something in your environment should not be running in your environment, consuming your resources and ultimately consuming your, your money. So yes, ransomware attacks are on the rise, 300 million cases you know, each year. 
And, and, and the sad thing is, you're dealing with people who have no ethics. Um, so even if you uh, paid those ransoms and just don't, um, then it, there's no um, guarantee that they would actually unlock your, your data. Now, there's a business model to say, actually, yeah, you know, unlock your data and it, uh, you know, that word gets around. Um, but still, I think it's starting to become law that you should not be paying um, these, uh, these ransoms. Um, but it costs a fortune. It, cost, it, it doesn't have to cost this much when it comes to recovery from, from ransomware. And interestingly, you know, as we, as we start, and I, 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 you know, I, I do deliberately have a lot of A's and R's and when I put, say start to come out of the pandemic, you know, as we went through the pandemic, more and more people were working from home. And unfortunately, home IT is not as resilient as, as you know, office IT. I mean, I guess there's people on the call who are probably, you know, the other way around. They probably scoff at their office IT versus the, you know, the racks of data. But on the whole, it generally is accepted that, you know, the, you know, home office IT is slightly different with less firewall protection than, than say, what you have in a, in a, in an office space. Uh, and so, in that case, you know, these people bringing laptops home, and you know, and the, the mobile workforce, unfortunately, has led to an increase in ransomware and how people respond to them incorrectly. Now let's look at a scenario in terms of uh, ransomware when it comes to you know being able to recover from traditional type of scenarios. So this is a world where we've seen we've deployed you know this application you know Lisa's been good she's deployed applications to to A B and C, but oh no we've got some malware that runs on our Amazon EKS cluster and it looks like this ransomware is particularly bad because it turns your application pink. Um, I, I have no um, you know actually I have nothing against the color pink but it looks like this is bad. Uh, bad news considering they run um, alternative color applications. So this is bad, so their environment is uh, is infected, but that's okay. They can go to their backups to do uh, recovery, but one of the unfortunate downsides to, uh, to ransomware is the fact that it now puts backup tools as a target. Um, so <laughs> So everything, all those bad actors know that to recover from ransomware, it's just terribly easy. You just recover from backups. They never really thought of that. Um, so what they've done is they've realized that that was the easy, you know, get out of jail free card. So what? guess what they do? They go and attack your, uh, your backups. So in this particular scenario, yes, they can go to their backups. They don't realize that there are, you know, the, the, the data on there is, you know, hiding some malware. So of course, you know, the recovery occurs. It's actually turned to green. So maybe this is even better than the original deployment. But oh no, it's turned to pink again. You know, we've now got back into this world where this application should not be uh, as it is. It's running the malware, it's running that ransomware. So let's look at an alternative approach to day two IT operations using, using Trilio. So in this case, we fully recognize that your backups are, are terribly important. Um, you know, in fact, we're underlining the fact that your data and applications are important. And so in that case, we support a variety of tools that, uh, that will make sure that those bad actors are staying away from, from that data. That, that's really important data and, and making sure that the backup uh, software is not the weakest link in your security. And so we support um, uh, immutability and encryption. Now, of course, you know, clever people on the phone and on the call, they will know that if we're just encrypting backups, for example, then that's okay. Um, but all that's saying is nobody can get access to the data inside of those backups. But of course, you know, ransomware doesn't care that the data is encrypted. It will just go and encrypt it with their own key. Um, and so you're in no better place. Uh, encryption protects you against um, a secondary part of ransomware, which obviously is exfiltration of data. In other words, stealing your data because the backups were the weakest link. And then you know, if you have paid your Bitcoin or even if you haven't, um, they can hold you uh, to some extortion campaigns um, because they've got access to all those that juicy data that they should not have access to. So that's what encryption protects you against. It doesn't protect you from the fact that you may need to then still pay the, the ransom in the first place. But that's where immutability comes in. And so we support immutability. You can individually um, mark your backups as immutable on appropriate um, uh, storage um, targets. And this allows you to basically have the guarantee that what we've backed up is, is genuinely not able to be changed. So in this case, if the you know, environment turned pink again, um, then you can do a recovery and it will be guaranteed that that application will go back as the correct 
deployed uh, recovery. So our approach to ransomware is the fact that we re recognize that, you know, um, it's, you know, it's not a single software feature. You know, there's multiple angles that you have to consider. And so we have a more comprehensive approach to our day two type of protecting um, uh, ransomware. And so when it comes to um, protecting of those workloads, we fully comply with what you would expect from all the, um, the, the, the you know, expected frameworks. And it allows you to identify those workloads, allows you to protect those um, those workloads, and um, and allows you to obviously have the the trust that you can recover those those workloads. But one of the things in there as well, and I'm just going to just make this point before uh, you know start to to wrap this up, is the fact that the you know you heard me talk emphatically about our open universal backup schema you know i said it has some great properties it has some great properties in terms of space savings again maybe people on the phone might not care too much honestly there's a lot of people that really care about that that side of things but one of the one of the things about having an open universal schema uh for, you know the, the the data format um not only does it allow you to get access to that data in any scenario you can think of but it also allows you, in a in a in a security context, allows you to um, to scan those those backups. So if I showed you the previous slide again, of course, you know you'd have those backups, and then you can bring your own tools. You can scan for malware of those backups. So yes, we can mark them as immutable. Yes, we can make them encrypted. But you don't know when that that um, bad code was sitting dormant. Um, it could be sitting dormant for many years and only get turned on on a certain date you know in the, in the calendar year and that is well known um, that malware does do that so again having that um open universal backup schema that qcow2 format the you know the data format is incredibly um uh you know uh, an important feature when it comes to consideration of, of your cloud journey so in summary so traditionally you know we have you know taking a, a you know a view of the world up you know back and recovery is a is a is a day two operation it's a you know, that's where that's where life almost began with backup and recovery it's almost like a an afterthought but it's an incredibly important um tool when it comes to everyday operations and everyday operations um includes a myriad of cases of why you need to recover workloads and why you'd need to to have the portability of, of backups in this, you know, this QCOW2 type format and this this JSON wrapped open universal schema, having that full capability of being able to deploy or redeploy that application wherever you need it to go, is vitally important for day two and beyond decisions in IT. But what we bring is the ability to to go much more further back into the into the evolution of of your uh, your <laughs> your journey. You know, we start at the beginning. We give you the ability to orchestrate the the data, the application, and the manipulation of data so that it makes sense for test and dev. We give you the tools that seamlessly fit into your pipeline that allow you to consume us. So it you know effectively gives you um, a much more you know, degree, a higher degree of confidence of that tested data as it moves through into production. And then when it comes to day one, you know, the, the support of the, of the environment, the, the evolution of managing the infrastructure using code, um, using the same um, lens and visibility through uh, the likes of GitHub and um, other source code repositories, then Trilio fits into this world by giving you the ability to manage Drift. It gives you the ability to manage migrations, and it gives you the ability to, to of course, the visibility into into what is running and what should be running in your infrastructure. And if you tie all these things together, you can see we give a comprehensive view of day zero, day one, and day two operations. So when it comes to uh, the compatibility of TVKs, because I know you're itching to, to jump off and install this, so. We support uh, any any Kubernetes cluster. Um, bring uh, bring your own storage uh, through CSI. Bring your own storage when it comes to uh, to tar uh, to the target. That's what we call where we're going to be writing out our backups to. And of course, we fit into all the ecosystem you would expect. We're part of this 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 world. We're designed very specifically to work 
with, in this case, Kubernetes. And we support a myriad uh, of applications and databases that you are you know, porting into, into Kubernetes. And we'll do this anywhere. So thank you very much. So I think we're now over to uh, to, to any questions. I, I hopefully um, you've um, been uh, paying attention uh, and you are more than happy to quiz me now on uh, on how we can fit into into your world. So let me just look and open the, the questions. So I've got I've got a couple here. Just bear with me. Just uh, okay. So. Um, I've got a question here, and it says, uh, can I use Trilio as part of my Argo CD pipeline? So obviously I mentioned um, Git up, you know, a few times. Obviously it's very easy to, to have Git roll off the tongue, uh, you, you know, in, and, and things. Obviously Git is part of that particular, uh, um, you know, pipeline process. But in terms of Argo CD specifically, um, yes. So um, when I talked of the uh, that GitHub runner, obviously that's just one small aspect of a, of a pipeline. Um, there's certainly no limitations uh, of where you can fit this into into your own use of of Trilio and, and fitting us into your, into your own um, pipelines. Um, in fact, um, I, I, I very specifically and I, and I and you know a couple of colleagues were um, recently working with a customer uh, this week um, that. Absolutely, is um, you know sits in the world of um, of GitOps, uh, and they manage all their infrastructure through through crow changes, uh, as you would expect. It's uh, it's um, and they they use um, they use Argo CD, and they 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 used it to d deploy Trilio across their multiple uh, environments. Um, and so again, you can see not only did I talk of the operational side of Trilio. Obviously, I touched on the fact that you'd like to get this installed. Um, they, these, these guys were actually uh, deploying this in an orchestrated fashion as well. So there's a lot of hands off uh, and gives them, the, you know, a, a, a level of a high level of protection uh, in a very much, uh, you know, hands off approach to managing the, the, their environment. Ooh, more, more questions are, uh, are coming in. So in terms of um, uh, this next one, it says. I can push my code to any environment. Why would I need uh, Trilio? Um, well, yes, uh, of course. Um, we're not replacing your ability to push code to production. Um, our world is to ensure you have the environment and data you need as, as an additional feature of your pipelines and, and workflows. Um, you can orchestrate your, uh, your deployment using your, using your, your favorite tool. Um, but connect the recovered data to the deployed part. So that was the example I, I was showing you um, earlier on. Um, so I think of that scenario I, you know, we had for, for Lisa and uh, and Brian. Um, but of course, you know, we're not limiting this to to just DevOps. Uh, you know, I you know I sit into into a bigger a bigger role, and um, this also applies to other conversations such as NFB and C CNS, where they orchestrate, um, you know parts of their environment and they, they can couple and join back up the, the recovered data in, in, in a very highly orchestrated fashion. And I think um, might have time for maybe one or, uh, or two more. So we've got here, um, we have data in databases that exist outside of Kubernetes. How does Trilio work in that scenario if you are wanting to develop against production data? So, so yeah, I I, um, I showed the the scenario where we take production data, and I guess the assumption there is the 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 you know the persistent volumes, you know the data that's part of the Kubernetes world, and we can you know seamlessly and orchestrate that you know back into into you know the day zero development kind of um, world. Um, well, I guess in terms of databases, there's obviously a few ways to to tackle this, and I'm pretty sure you know. DBAs, uh, the database administrators would have their own say on how they could, you know, use this for their particular their own platform specific way. But from a Trilio point of view, um, we do acknowledge that you're, um, you know, that there is there is alternative ways. But for for other people who want to consume this completely from an, a fully orchestrated way, in the manner that I just showed, um, then Trilio is actually looking at how we can back up. External databases, so databases that you know 
traditionally live outside of, uh, of a Kubernetes uh, cluster. And using the same tools and techniques from, from TVK, from truly evolved Kubernetes. Um, you know, specifically, we're looking at the, what we call uh, hook scripts. Um, um, we can actually grab that um, database data and then using that same pipeline workflow, allow you to recover those that database data to wherever um, database is required. So in other words, from prod data to cleaning it, to, to putting this into, into development um, database. And I think I might have time for just one more, um, which is you talked about malware and effective backups. Do you provide tools to scan your backups? So I touched on this just at the very end. Um, and uh, you know, I said it's a, it's a bring your own tool um, uh, world uh, you know, currently. So again, our, um, just to reiterate, our backup format is open. Uh, it's open source, QCOW2. Um, and that allows you know, great accessibility, obviously in a controlled fashion. Let's be really honest here, not everybody would have access to your backups. Um, but you'd have a process on there which allows you to say, okay, um, uh, basically um, access those, those, that backup, that sacred backup environment, and then any tool can access those QCOW2 files. So you can have your scanning, your automated scanning that you control, and then you can have the assurances that, that um, those backups are, um, are secure and, and safe. But we're also looking at um, being able to have that literally as part of a, of a you know, a, a Trilio uh, workflow, and that's, that's, that's certainly work in, in progress. But for now, absolutely, again, this fantastic open universal schema, it's designed for the cloud, it's designed for how you want to consume. Um, this is one of those features where you can just uh, bring your own tool in this, um, and, uh, and that will make your uh, security team very, very uh, happy. So, I think um, I, I don't see any more uh, any more questions. So I, I genuinely thank you for your time today. I hope that was uh, uh, very beneficial. And of course, you know, we definitely encourage you to uh, to try Trulia Vault uh, for yourself, and then certainly give us feedback and how you're using these in your uh, your DevOps uh, world. All right, and with that, Dzone would like to thank Kevin for a great and informative presentation. Dzone would also like to thank Trulio for providing the audience with a great webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career.